Um, so, uh, okay, so we have the last speaker of the day was going to be Rafael Stenzel, and the title of his talk is The Comparison Lemma in Higher Topos Theory. And uh, Rafael, take the stage. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk, and I hope it will be a pleasure for you too. Um, I, you will receive uh, fake news uh, on the newsletter uh, with a different title and different abstract. Uh, you will uh, be in for this now. I hope that's fine. If anybody uh, um, would like to object, do it now. Great. Um, so, whoops. Cable fell. All right. So um, the talk will be about a very about a very specific statement in topos theory which is known as the comparison lemma. I'm not sure who gave it that name. It's uh, the name in Johnson's elephant. And so uh, what I want to start with is I want to remind you what the lemma says in the original context and uh, talk a little bit about why it is useful uh, and then move on to the infinity categorical context and discuss it there. And in fact, if somebody uh, is aware of some references in, in the literature that I apparently am not aware of, if I'm not citing them, but then please do uh, remind me of that in the end of the talk. It's very possible that I missed something. All right, um, so to start, let's recall that topos, right, uh, is by definition um, a category of sheaves over a small site that is a small category together with the Brodnik topology on that, which again, by definition, is the full subcategory of pre-sheaves from, uh, from C to, well, from C up to Z, which uh, take uh, covering sieves uh, to, uh, well, limiting um, diagrams, right? So uh, the way I wrote it here is just a slick way to write down the sheaf sequence. So there, there are various descriptions of what a topos is, but this is just one of many. So it's a classical statement that uh, a category E is a topos, if and only if it arises as the left exact effective localization of a pre sheaf topos. And this is, in turn, for those logically minded, the same thing as to ask for certain internal axioms. Uh, and one set of these axioms describes E as an infinitary pretopos with a separating set. So an infinitary pretopos is, uh, an, in, uh, is an infinitary coherent uh, category, which is infinitary extensive and exact, and which have, has a separating set, separating set, which makes it presentable or locally presentable, right? As Marco uh, pointed out. And they are very used to which both describe the same thing. So the comparison lemma, as far as I'm aware, uh, it was stated first by Verdier in the 70s. And it's, uh, I mean, there are various generalizations of that, but one version of it says that uh, if you start with a um, with a potentially large but locally small category D, and you have a Grotnik topology K on that, and say you have another small category C, together with some map F from C to D, which satisfies certain axioms. Certain so usually it's fully faithful, or sometimes it's just faithful, sometimes it's even less, uh, and you have a notion of density, which is relative to your growing topology K. Suppose you have such a map, uh, then you can construct a growing topology J on C, such that the restriction functor on pre sheaf categories here, uh, well, you can restrict that guy to sheaves, on the, to the full, category, uh, full subcategory of sheaves on D, and then first of all, you want that it lands uh, in the J sheaves over C. And second, you want that this comparison map is an equivalence of toposis. And uh, well, one version, uh, one, 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 the proof of one version you find in Johnson's book. And uh, in considerable generality, you find it in a paper by Schumann uh, on exact completions. Right. So why is that useful? Uh, well, there are plenty of uh, situations which I haven't looked at, but uh, one of the most classical ones is uh, uh, you use it. You can, you can you can use it to show that the canonical site on a, on a topos is essentially small, right? So an, a topos is a large category, um, and you can uh, still look at the growing topology given by the jointly epic uh, families on it, uh, and then you want to show that this uh, well, is an essentially small site for various applications, and you can do that using the comparison lemma by just uh, taking a large enough uh, kappa and then embedding the kappa convex objects in there, and then uh, using the comparison lemma to construct a growing topology on that small category, which uh, re uh, retrieves E, and in particular, the canonical site on E. Um, another little exercise that is also uh, in Johnson's book is uh, you can use it to show that uh, every topos has a presentation 
uh, such that E is uh, densely embedded in uh, the category of pre-sheaves in there, which means that the uh, initial pre-sheaf is a sheaf for it, which sometimes saves you uh, an annoying case distinction in certain statements that you might want to show. And uh, another example, because it's all the rage, um, you, well, you can consider the, the category of condensed sets, right, uh, which is defined as a certain sheaf category. Well, almost up to size. Let me put topos and quotation marks, but it serves the purpose for um, what I want to talk about. Um, and it's defined uh, either on uh, on the category of uh, profinite spaces or profinite sets, uh, the category that only uh, that Simon <laughs> talked about earlier in the beginning. Uh, and you can use it, uh, for instance, it, it is uh, one can you reduce it to a subcategory that is the category of extremely disconnected compact Hausdorff spaces, uh, which is uh, basically an extensive category. I'm actually I never I never checked the axioms if it's actually an extensive category. Uh, it looks like it, but whatever I, it, it doesn't really matter. What I want to say is that uh, you have a very simple Grotnik topology on that um, that recovers um, the more complicated covers on profinite sets or even on the larger category of all compact house of spaces. Um, and so the, the simple description of the sheaves for this thing, which are just product preserving functors, uh, allows you uh, um, to, well, write more, more core limits commute with products uh, than with more complicated limits. And this in, turns, uh, this in turn turns out to uh, makes it, makes it to, to make the category of sheaves over it to be a, a very good environment in homological algebra. In. So you want to have certain uh, axioms of a Grotnik category, um, and th they are just more of these axioms satisfied uh, in, in arbitrary sheaf categories. All right. So uh, now to higher topos theory. So um, let us first recall what is an infinity topos. Well, we saw that a one topos is essentially the same thing as a left exact localization of a pre sheaf topos. Uh, and this is, the, this is the standard definition of an infinity topos. So uh, an infinity topos is an infinity category E, which arises as a left exact reflective localization of a pre sheaf topos, together with this annoying additional um, condition that is an accessible re reflective localization. So in the in the one topos case, accessibility follows. Uh, in the general infinity categorical setting, it's not known if that follows or not. It appears not to, but it's it's, it's open. So we have to add that anyway. Now, uh, for the sake of this talk, we make a very simple definition. Namely, we say that an infinity one side consists of two things. It's an infinity category C, potentially large, uh, together with a uh, with a with a topos that uh, arises as a well as a subtopos of the pre sheaves over C. All right, that's it. So we don't talk about topologies or anything. We just really talk about the infinity category of sheaf or sheaf theories over it, whatever the notion of topology is. And then additionally, we say that it's such an infinity one side CE is small if first C is a small infinity category, and second, the right adjoint is accessible. So we have to make two, two, uh, two we, we assume two things because of the note that I stated earlier. Okay, then furthermore, uh, we have a special case, and then we, uh, we can define a Grotnik site, which is an infinity category C, together with just a simple Grotnik topology on C, which is basically the same thing as to give a Grotnik topology on its homotopy category. So it's not really a new notion. Now, uh, so whenever we start the small category, then we can just uh, go to pre sheaves and localize at the well, covering sieves, and we get an infinity topos, which we will denote by, uh, well, J sheaves over C. And so every Grotnik site induces the, uh, induces the structure of a small infinity one site, right? By the, given by the tuple C and the infinity topos of J sheaves over C. And one may consider these to be the topological infinity one sites uh, following the terminology of Lurie. Namely, when we take any small infinity one site, C comma E, then we can always factor it through something topological. So for every E and a uh, fixed C, uh, there is a there's a unique Grotnik topology J on C, such that this 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 composite, right? So this uh, localization that we start with factors through uh, one one localization into the um, into the J sheaves, which is by definition topological localization, meaning it's generated by Grotnik topology. And the second one is uh, is co-topological, which means it only uh, inverts infinity connected maps. So it's 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 very minor, but still non-trivial. 
Yeah, so uh, the remark here is that the right-hand side, the code topological localization is generally non-trivial, and this is crucial. Anyway, many examples that are considered in the literature that you find, especially in geometry and topology, are usually topological sheaf theories. They are still uh, sheaves of spaces, but generated by topologies on some, usually a usually one side. All right. So given that, uh, given two infinity one sides, first a small one, CE, and then a potentially large one, DF, we can define what it means for a functor from C to D to be cover preserving. Namely, we define it in this in the setting just as a functor from C to D, such that when we go to pre sheaves and have the restriction functor here, we restrict it to F, then we land in E, right? So F sheaves yield E sheaves. Then if C and D are furthermore left exact, so they have small limits, which then is to say that, well, the site CE is Cartesian, which just means the underlying category, the underlying affinity category is left exact. Then we say that a morphism of Cartesian one sites is a left exact functor, which is additionally cover preserving. And then furthermore, we call such an amorphism an equivalence of Cartesian sites. If this functor here, which exists because it's cover preserving, is actually an equivalence of infinity categories. So pretty much standard generalizations of a, a very uh, of a very uh, like tame situation in the one categorical world. All right, and then last definition I think is uh, we say that a potentially large infinity one side, a Cartesian infinity one side DF is essentially small if there is a small presentation. Right? So if there is a small infinity one side CE together with an, with an equivalence uh, DF uh, uh, with an equivalence from CE to DF. It's, the direction is kind of crucial because if we go back, we, we talked about your geometric warps, that's ugly, but we talked about a geometric morphism here. So in particular, it has a left joint, right? But this left joint only exists if C is small, right? Otherwise, we, we, it's, it's, de it's defined by left Kahn extension and that left Kahn extension is defined as an, uh, uh, by, uh, by index categories given by C. And if C is large, these co-limits don't necessarily even exist. Okay, so to relate this back to um, to the uh, usual notions in, in, in one topos theory, so whenever both C, J, and D, K are growth leak sites, Cartesian growth leak sites, but then a Cartesian morphism from C to D is cover preserving this definition, if and only if it's so in the conventional sense. So the conventional sense says uh, a functor f from C, J to D, K is cover preserving if for every J cover S on an object C, we can map it uh, to 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 a uh, well to a to a covering sieve on FC, um, or we can map it to a family of arrows and then generate a sieve by that. And we want that every J covering uses the K cover in this way. Uh, but Cartesianism is important here. So one direction holds always, but the other one direction I'm not sure if it holds uh, without the assumption of Cartesianism. All right. Oh, okay, I lied to you. One more definition. Okay, so we had the, uh, the notion of density in the comparison lemma earlier. And so uh, we use the following notion of density in this context. So if we start with infinity one side DF and uh, we consider a fully faithful functor, so we uh, again look at the very tame situation, a fully faithful functor C to D out of a small infinity category C, then we call this embedding dense for the infinity one side DF. If for all objects in, in the codomain, a certain gap map out of a co-limit becomes an equivalence. So we can we, we, we read this as kind of a global version to say that, right, uh, we look at all the the F oh, Jesus. We look at all the objects FC in the image, and then we have our fixed object T. And we want that the image of F under uh, the, the, the image of F covers every object in D in this in this global way, right? And uh, covering means well, it, it when we uh, when we when we uh, localize it uh, given the shift given given the, the infinity one side in F, it becomes an equivalence, right? So it's it's local, it's F local. Now note that these are generally mon not monomorphisms, right? Um, so it's a more general notion of a cover. In fact. We have the following uh, specification. Whenever D is a uh, DK is a Grotendieck site, 
then we say that a fully faithful factor f from c to d is topologically k-dense if the image factorization of this map here is a whoops, is a k cover, right? So we have this map in pre-sheaves and we can factor this into its image and then a mono. And this is always a SID, a definition of a YD, right? It's just a monomorphism of the representable. And so we can ask this to be a cover. Um, yeah, and it turns out that this is a, so let me, yeah, I'll say this in a minute. So uh, first of all, to relate this to the usual notion of density. So whenever uh, DK is a growth leak site, then topological k-density of a fully faithful functor is the same thing as k-density. The, the important side. thing is there are two steps. Are you talking with me? OK. <laughs> so what does, what does uh, k-density mean in the context of fully faithful embedding? It just means that for every object, D in the codomain, the SIF generated by all these morphisms I just worked down before is, is, is k cover. That's just the same thing. But the important thing is that k density in the first sense, so this, this, uh, this, this first definition of density, is stronger than that of topological k density, even for growing topologies k. This is not the case in, in, in one topos theory. There, uh, but in, in higher topos theories, uh, in, high, in higher topos it is. So, and this will be this will be basically what I want to talk about. What, that, that will be the underlying uh, feature of what I want to talk about. So, you can say the comparison lemma, but I don't know how how helpful it, it, it will be in practice. So, let me state it first. So, if we start with a Cartesian one side df, which is potentially large, and say you have a small f exact infinity category and the Cartesian functor from C to D, it's not necessarily fully faithful yet, but it will be assumed soon. Then first, if this topos, right, uh, this infinity topos f is locally, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, it's not necessarily infinity topos yet because I didn't assume it uh, to because of size reasons, right? But if I assume f this left exact localization of pre sheaves over d uh, is locally presentable, then I can always find uh, an associated left exact localization on the other side. Um, which uh, turns this map to be cover preserving. And it, there isn't just some, there's always like a maximal one. When I additionally assume that F is fully faithful and dense, then uh, there is a, um, then there's a unique infinity one side E on C, which turns this actually into an equivalence of Cartesian infinity one sides, right? And furthermore, uh, Whenever f is fully faithful and f dense, and also f is locally presentable, then parts one and two basically say the same thing. I can combine them. Um, so note that local presentability gives us smallness on the left hand side, and fully faithfulness density here gives us an equivalence. But this guy here is not necessarily small, right? So c is a small category, but the localization here is not necessarily accessible. Uh, and the proof is fairly straightforward. Like you, 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 you look at the proof in one category theory and uh, see what might go wrong, and which in fact turns out to go wrong. But then you assume the stronger notion of density, and then that fixes that. And uh, the proof looks a bit different, but in essence, it's the same proof. Uh, so one corollary that you get from that is uh, the, the same one that you get in one topos theory, namely if you start with infinity topos, then you can look at Oh, this should be an E, sorry, not a C. Uh, then you can look at functors from E up to spaces, right? E is a large category now, but you can still look at this pre-shift category. And you define the full subcategory spent by those pre sheaves which take all small limits to small limits. Yeah. Uh, then you first can show that this inclusion, now because things are large, you can't really use the um, or a, a drawing functor theorem stuff uh, to construct a left exact left joint, but you can construct it more or less by hand and using the comparison lemma, for example. Um, and it follows then that the pair E and the canonical side on E defines, well, it defines an infinity one side because you have that uh, left exact reflective localization. Uh, and furthermore, the proof shows that uh, this infinity one side is in fact Cartesian and it's essentially small. So Cartesian is trivial because E is an infinity purpose. An essential smallness uh, then follows from the, the way you construct this uh, left exact left adjoint. And this will not. This will be no secret to anyone. So this uh, uh, this statement is more or less contained in Lurie's book, proven in another way. 
although uh, the proof of the existence of a left exact left join in this case, I don't understand. I, maybe maybe it might be that there is a, 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 a loop, uh, like a like a feedback loop in this proof, or that I'm just too dim. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, like the proof with the comparison, I, might, I find personally much clearer. Um, and then a, a remark to local presentability in the, in the statement of the comparison lemma in the, in the first part where we don't assume fully faithfulness, but just having a Cartesian functor. So local presentability is a way to uh, construct this uh, infinity one side on the left-hand side by brute force, just by, again, uh, using that you have a small generating set and then um, applying um, uh, the theory of well, localizations. But one can avoid this assumption effect uh, by trying to apply other tricks. And one, one of these tricks would be if we could take like, um, uh, if, if, you would, if you would have a subjection embedding factorization between well, infinity log OE, which are the infinity version of um, infinitary pretoposes, right? Uh, the, I mean, what does the subjection embedding factorization do? It says that if we have a geometric morphism between two infinity toposes or more generally infinity logoses, then it says that uh, you can look at this geometric morphism as an adjunction, and then you take the common net on the one side where the common net exists, and then take the category of co-algebras. Uh, and that is always this. Uh, this gives always this gives you always an, again an infinity topos uh, with a geometric morphism. And then you have a factorization of the original geometric morphism. And some the the proof in the one topos case where you where, where I think I don't know if it was Johnson who proved it first. Uh, that this uh, um, factorization exists uh, uses the back monodicity theorem. And the back monodicity theorem has, has a very specific form in one category theory. It has a, has a slightly different um, uh, state, uh, like, a, like a different form in the infinity categorical world. And there is a, there, there, in the one categorical world, what you work with as um, split equal, like F split equalizers, which are finite limits, and because your morphism is geometric, it preserves finite limits, and these things do match well to get this factorization. In the infinity categorical world, geometric morphism is still something that where the left adjoint preserves finite limits, but the limits you work with in this factorization for the monodicity theorem are now uh, limits of uh, split co-simplicial sets, like co-augmented co-simplicial sets. Or simplicial sets, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I have to write it down. Anyway, it's an, it's an infinite index limit. And somehow there's a mismatch, and I don't know if such a subjection embedding factorization even exists in the infinity topos uh, world. One other way to avoid uh, local presentability uh, is to assume that the codomain df is not just some infinity one side, but it's actually a topological one, so that f is a Grotnik topology of d. So uh, there is a similar statement, namely, if we start with a Cartesian Grotnik side, dk. And again, we have a small left exact uh, infinity category C together with a Cartesian functor from C to D. Then we get the following statements. First, uh, we can always pull this uh, growing topology K back to growing topology on, on J, such that the according map is uh, cover preserving and in a way that there's always a maximal such growing topology. Second, whenever F is fully faithful, then this growing topology J on K, in fact, not just induces some geometric morphism, but it induces an embedding of infinity toposes, which means that the right joint is fully faithful. But now the problem is that this embedding is generally not an equivalence of Cartesian infinity one sides, even in the best case scenario. So if you assume that uh, this uh, the, the functor F is topologically K dense uh, and fully faithful, then it will generally not give you an equivalence of, uh, of sheet theories. And which is which, which is this, the kind of thing you do get in uh, one topos uh, theory. So, which was the statement in the beginning uh, that I showed you. Um, and in fact, uh, in the special case that the category D is a semi topos, so it's a definition in Ruiz's book, in case the growing topology on D generated by the jointly epic families. So uh, let's call this in the uh, in the following the ordinary geometric Grotnik topology on such a category D, uh, infinity category D. Then uh, this the first two parts of the proposition are exactly contained in one of the sections in Lewis' book. So the, uh, the the first part here, the first part of the 
with the theorem generates exactly what Louis calls the canonical Grotten topology on C with respect to F. And he kind of does not talk about a comparison lemma or, uh, well, equivalences of uh, Cartesian infinity one sides. Uh, and it turns out it doesn't work. So what I want to end this talk with is uh, the following theorem. Namely, uh, I want to state that even in the best case scenario, um, the uh, such a such, such a such an embedding does not induce an equivalence of, of Cartesian infinity one sides. So the statement is that there is a Cartesian fully faithful functor C to D from a small f exact infinity category C, so good in fact that it's a locale into not just some category D but a locale like infinity top of D, which is equipped with the ordinary geometric Grotnik topology on it. So the Grotnik topology on D generated by the jointly epic covers such that F is topologically dense for this Grotnik topology, but there's no infinity one side E on C, which turns the functor F into an equivalence of Cartesian open sides, infinity one sides. So in particular, there's no Grotnik topology on C either. So I'm right. So the statement doesn't say that only there is no Grotnik topology, but there's nothing. There's, there's no notion of, not even a more general notion of side, which would give you an equivalence. And the proof is uh, the following. So uh, we use a black box theorem uh, to give it. Namely, uh, the, the statement says that um, there is a small locale Grotnik site CJ. So C is a locale. Uh, and it comes together with a canonical Grotnik topology, therefore. Um, and then we can look at the category D to be just the infinity topos of J sheaves on it, right? And so, because D is an affinity topos, uh, well, forget about size issues because we can um, restrict this to like kappa compact generators and make it all small. So that's that, that, that's no problem. We can look at pre-sheaves over D, and then we can look at uh, the canonical uh, sheaf theory over D, which we talked about before. And we can factor this into a through its topological part, right? And it turns out its topological part is exactly given by the Grotnik topology of uh, ep jointly ep epic families. So uh, we always have this um, infinity topos sitting in between. This localization is by definition topological because this is a Grotnik topology. And it turns out that this part here is called topological. But uh, yes, the statement is, this is provably non-trivial. The second part is not an identity. It's a non-trivial localization. So which in particular means, that generally the uh, Grotnik topology of epic joint of jointly epic families is not canonical. Now, if we take this particular Grotnik site, then we can consider its unit embedding into J sheaves, right? We go into pre sheaves and then we localize and take the composite. We consider this to be F, and so F is because right uh, both like the unit embedding is left exact and the localization is left exact, so F is Cartesian. It's fully faithful. Because uh, it's a canonical, it's a subcanonical Grotnik topology, and it's dense in the sense that uh, it, right, it generates this, uh, it generates this category under this infinity category under call limits. And so, in particular, it's topologically dense for this Grotnik topology. So it satisfies all the all the boxes in the in the in the theorem. And so now we look at the following diagram. So. We have our category, our local C, and we have our embedding into D, right? And we can, uh, on both sides, uh, take the unit embedding, the pre sheaves, and look at the associated um, geometric morphism here. And we can furthermore then uh, localize a J. This is the composition here, right, on the left hand side. And we can localize this guy here to obtain the, the um, uh, canonical. Um, Sheep theory over this guy. And uh, we get just by formal reasons, uh, we get a uh, geometric morphism here. And because this is just D itself, it's, it's easy to see that this is an equivalent. So this, this exists, right? And we have on the, on the right-hand side, we have this localization just by assumption, uh, not by assumption, by the theorem. So let us now assume that there is some infinity one side on the left-hand side, which gives us an, such that F induces an equivalence here. Right, let's assume that. Then what one can show is 
that this has to be automatically topological. This will be a consequence. And because we, we know that this is topological, right? We saw oh, Jesus again. To, to logical, and this is co-logical. Now, because both sides, the top and the bottom, are equivalences, this is also co-topological, right? So you will maybe believe me if you don't know what that means, is uh, that it's in a notion invariant under equivalence. But by assumption, this is a Grotnik topology, so this is topological. But it turns out, it's also containing Louis' book, and it's hard to prove that the factorization of any reflective, of, of any left exact reflective localization in this context into a topological and then cotopological map is unique up to equivalence. All right. And by uniqueness, it follows that this has to be an equivalence effect. Right? Because we have two factorizations into first topological and then a cotopological map. But this means that all these three corners are equivalences, which in turn means that this is an equivalence. But this is a contradiction to our choice of C and D. Right? Our choice of C and D was such that this localization is not trivial. So this gives us a contradiction, which means that such E cannot exist. Now, this has uh, some consequences. Namely, first of all, uh, the specific counterexample we gave, we gave in the proof, means that Lewis' canonical Grotnik topology construction generally does not induce an equivalence of sheaf theories, even in the best case scenario, if the function is fully faithful, Cartesian, and dense, but gives us an embedding at best. And it also shows that the argument of essential smallness of the canonical site over an infinity topos E that I sketched does not apply to the ordinary geometric infinity one set on E. So this makes it questionable whether this guy here, so an affinity topos E together with its ordinary geometric affinity one side given by jointly epic covers, whether this is a small presentation at all. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, I maybe does, I can imagine it does not, but I don't know how to prove that. And the reason I, even, I actually looked into uh, at this comparison lemma in this context was that in the beginning, I thought it holds, I thought it should hold. Uh, and the same proof that I gave you to show that it doesn't, you could use that if it was to hold, you could construct an infinity topos, namely the one that I just gave you, uh, which has no topological presentation over any base at all. I mean, depending on the comparison lemma that you have, right? if the comparison lemma that, you, that would hold would say something about Cartesian functions with, with, with left exact domain, then you have a left exact base. If you would have a more general one, you could scratch this. Um, so if you would have a topological comparison lemma, you could use this proof to, to construct an infinity topos, which has no topological presentation over any base, uh, which is an open question of RESC. So uh, Charles RESC uh, had this open question, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, asking, he, he, he knew that if you start with a presentation C, right, if you start with a small category C, and you know that uh, E is given, then this is not always topological, right? That's uh, examples were known since 2002. Um, but there could still be another C prime, right? Such that there is some localization where it's topological over here, right? It's 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 not clear. And if you had a topological comparison lemma, the proof that I just gave you would give you such an E. But instead, I proved that the topological comparison lemma doesn't hold. Just a bummer, but well, true. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, and that's my talk. Um, that the references are, again, uh, Johnson's book, uh, Lurie's book, and uh, the paper from Schulman that I uh, talked about in the beginning. Uh, the black box theorem is in my preprint on high geometric shift theories, and the whole thing I talked about is in this preprint about infinity one sites. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael, for your talk. And now we move to, uh, we have our round of silent applause, which is silent. And now we move to question time. So if someone has a question, please unmute yourself and chip in. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, so in one topos theory, there is a version of the comparison lemma that works for a, an arbitrary function, not necessarily fully faithful, which is in the paper mm -hmm. of Dyke and Koch. 
which I always thought was uh, was begging for a higher categorical version. Have you uh, looked at all at uh, what we can do without assuming fully faithfulness? Yeah, so uh, I tried to look at it. So there, there, there are basically two dimensions, right? There's on the one hand fully faithfulness, and then there's left exactness, right? There are these uh, yeah. two things that I that I assume. And it turned. I mean, I tried to first show the best case scenario, and I already ran in massive troubles in, in fully faithfulness and Cartesian closeness, right? In the topological yeah. case, it totally broke, and in the general case, I have this the, the size issues uh, where I had to assume mm. local presentability and things like that. Um, so I. If I um yes no here yeah. yeah so the first part here doesn't assume fully faithfulness right but it doesn't say, tell you it doesn't say that you have an equivalence of uh, infinity one size you just yeah, yeah. cover preserving that um so no but in the in the in the one topos case the, the assumption is much stronger than density for non faithful non fully faithful functor Yes, indeed, indeed, and I don't know what. Yeah, I didn't look at what you would have to explain, oh. what you what what you have to assume there. But yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair question. It makes sense to to look at that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so far, I mean, yeah, this talk was mostly about look at the best case scenario and see that a lot of things break already, uh, and this is where I, <laughs> this is where I am right now. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, right, I mean, some I talked about this example of condensed sets uh, in the beginning, and right, I mean, Klaus and Scholz, uh, right, immediately move up to condensed spaces, or condensed anima, right? And, and they are also have the problem that they have to hypercompute everything because uh, somehow if you, if you look at extremely disconnected spaces and this extensive topology on that this is automatically hyper complete but uh they don't know if the same holds true for the site over profile spaces or compact host of, host of spaces uh and i mean if the if the comparison would still hold then you would immediately you wouldn't have to do all this this right this this shebang but you have to because they don't know that if there's such a thing yeah that makes sense we have other questions okay if we don't then we thank Raphael for the talk one last time and thank you Raphael for coming and we thank all the speakers that join us today and on the people that came and I have one last thing. I just checked the Itaca webpage and the list of speakers is online. So if you want to check out who's going to give a talk at Itaca, you can. I mean, the, the physical event. And this was also the last uh, event of Itaca Fest for this year. So I think uh, see you next year with Itaca Fest. And yeah, uh, I, I think I'm done for my job today. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Um, Thank you. Thank you, guys. And the videos will be online as soon as possible. And if someone